one uh, is the issue of um, teachers still not understanding the types of research designs and science that you use. Uh, it is an ongoing issue. I was on one of your teachers' websites and I saw the scientific method uh, in the first day. Is it sixth grade? No, it's not. It was a sixth grade teacher. But anyway. They also teach in sixth grade. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> At any rate, uh, so that that is a, a problem. Kim, yeah, I'll wrap you. You're the one that's in school. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll wait until you're done speaking at transition time. Go ahead, Dr. West. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so, as I said, it, it is an ongoing problem. One of the things that you're going to do today is you're going to look at an article that I wrote back in 04, I think it was, a long time ago when the last teaks were written, that try to clarify this. And I know a lot of districts, big districts, that use the article in their training. Uh, it... Had, so it's had some impact in trying to clarify this. And I think I may have told you the story, but <clears throat> I became aware of this many years ago because when I was teaching high school, I had a ninth grader who was working with a scientist in the uh, in San Antonio area. And they were uh, looking at the ephemeral pools on top of enchanted rocks. So these are pools that come and go with, you know, wet and dry. And there's a brachiopod that apparently is there. And uh, this ninth grade, 14-year-old, discovered a new species. Now, you know, how rare is that? So he took it to science fair. And at science fair, he had 10 points counted off because he had no control. And I said, what? What do you mean, no control? You have no control. There is no control for this type of investigation. And you're saying that... A, a new species in the world discovery is not good enough to go to regional by, by, by counting 10 points off, but that was in their score sheet. So th this was back in probably 1990, a long time ago. So I went to the Texas Academy of Science and they wrote a position paper about the three types of research designs and that actually got into the last set of TEKS and is still in the current set of TEKS. <coughs> Uh, but we still see a lot of problems with it um, out in schools uh, for a lot of reasons. The second reason why we're looking at this today is because of the problem that we've seen with our graduates, our majors, our biology majors who come into my methods course, and we're, we're trying to teach about these three types of research designs, and they do not automatically make the connection back to their own coursework in which they experienced these three types. So uh, two semesters ago, we started um, looking at what their experiences were, particularly in their ecology course, and tried to say, okay, remember when you did this investigation in ecology, it was this type of investigation. That would have been helpful. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, <laughs> well, now we know. <laughs> so um, for those two reasons, uh, that was uh, those are the two reasons why we decided to go ahead and to look at this uh, today to make sure you have a clear understanding and to make sure you understand the kind of math that is linked with it and when it would be appropriate to use the kind of math that we're talking about. So we're going to start off with uh, a activity here uh, called observing. Actually, turn it on. Okay, there we go. All right, so, um, no, please, okay. Yeah, so uh, just uh, choose one and um, quickly pass it on. So, Ruby, would you would facilitate that for us, please? You're not gonna bring, you're not gonna pass the individual on, you're just gonna pass the basket on at this point. <clears throat> Alright, so I'd like for you to make some observations on your object. And then uh, we're going to have you pass those forward and we're gonna put them back in the basket.
Okay, now I'd like for you to pass those. Uh, why don't you pass them to the back, and Ruby can put those back in the basket. Okay, now we have a basket full of those objects back there. How many of you think you could find your original objects, and how sure are you? Would you be willing to... Are you looking at that basket? Mm -hmm. Hold the basket where they can actually see it. Okay. There's probably about 50 leaves in there. Would you be willing to wage money on it? Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Stop collecting it. It depends on the time limit, not the 60 seconds. No. Okay. All right. So if you think you couldn't, why do you think you couldn't? What would be some reasons why you think you couldn't? I want you to observations that they make in their research uh, over a long period of time uh, can either impede or enhance their ability to answer your research question or questions. So can you think of some successful scientists who have, are famous for the discovery uh, of, that they're famous for because it was due to their observation skills? Can you think of some? Newton. Yeah. Okay. When you when you think of Newton, what do you think of? Physics. Physics. Yeah. I didn't hear any of you say, okay, yeah, a lot of people say the apple, which probably did not happen, as you you know. But what happened with Newton was he of course he was a physicist and this was the time of the plague in London and so what they did was really wise, they dispersed the population who could disperse uh, out into the countryside and uh, to get away from the plague, and that was uh, over a year's period. So he had a lot of thinking time. And this is important for all of us to have thinking time, to not be so busy that we don't have time to think about uh, things and problem solve, etc. And so this is when he came up with this theory, uh, the gravitational theory. Um, and oftentimes it was a, a local thought. Um, I'll be a little a little extreme here. So you have gravity in San Marcos, but you don't have it in Austin, for example. So they, you know, they thought it was kind of local. And so he came up with this universal theory uh, because of observations, you know, that he made. What about Fleming? Alexander Fleming. Anybody know Fleming? I have a little scar right here. Oh, uh, uh, the shot. Uh, Oh, yeah. shot. Oh, not the shot. Not a shot. Antibiotics. Oh. Oh. Small, the vaccines. It's a vaccine. It's a smallpox nice. vaccine. Does anybody remember how he kind of got to that point down the road with a vaccine against a very deadly disease we call oh, smallpox? That, yeah, and then he hit the, the milkmaids. He observed the milkmaids. What? They uh, would have a cow version of it, but then they got Right, better. they would get cowpox, but they didn't get the They didn't get the deadly smallpox. So. His idea was to be able to transfer that kind of immunity to humans uh, by introducing smallpox in an abnormal way to the body. So he did this by taking some, some pus from smallpox uh, victims and scratching the skin. In fact, he tried it out on himself first. And scratching the skin, made a little scab, and then that, that developed the immunity. And the way immunity works is that if you introduce a disease-causing organism in an abnormal way, let's say you get it through, you know, through breathing, but you introduce it through the skin, then the um, the disease-causing organism is at a, a, a 
is uh, dis is at a disadvantage, and so the body is able to build up the you know the antibodies against it and develop that immunity with it. So that's kind of how vaccines work with it. So uh, that was Alexander Fleming. What about Jenner, Edward Jenner? Microscopic. Is he penicillin? Mark. Penicillin? Yeah. 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 Penicillin. Okay. That's our math teacher. All right. Go. Well, because uh, I'm yes. very yeah. allergic so, to it. And uh, I did a little <laughs> so, research okay, on so it. And I found out the hard way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, what Jenner did, and this is a nice story. I don't know how true it is, but he was culturing, you know, some specimens on the petri dishes, and he noticed that there was uh, there was a, a fungus growing, and it, you know, killed these bacteria. And instead of saying "oh poo" and throwing them in the trash can, he thought, "Oh well, maybe there's something to this." And so the idea was that this was the penicillium fungus, and so he was able to extract the penicillin antibody that we have. But again, it's those observation skills that led to uh, literally every discovery that has ever been made. These are just a few of them. Uh, what about Barbara McClintock? I like her story, and I'm sure none of you know. I want you to notice what I'm wearing for pants, okay? Right. My watch. Who's Genetics. Genetics. Jeans. <laughs> Jumping jeans. So in other words, jeans were not were not stationary on the chromosome, but they actually moved. And she discovered this actually back in the 1940s. And um, the rest of the scientific community went, oh poo, what do you know? And finally they came back to it in the 60s and rediscovered it. And then they went back in the literature. That's why it's so important to publish, is they went back in the literature and sure enough, um, the clinic had published something on this back in the 40s and she ended up with a Nobel Prize as a result of it. So again, you know, some, some nice stories about uh, why observations are so important in science. Well, observation skills are a skill and skills can be taught. And they're actually part of uh, our history called the inquiry or problem solving skills in science. And uh, historically, you know, probably 50, 60 years ago, they were named as the process skills of science or scientific thinking skills or the process approach. So this is not new. You know, we've been trying to, uh, to identify this for our students as part of science, it, of what we use with our uh, observation skills. Uh, the idea of this process approach was to help students understand the spirit of scientific thinking. Uh, in investigating, and it, it had a name, and it was called Science as a Way of Investigating. There was also Science as a Way of Knowing um, that uh, was used to, under, to help people understand science better. Uh, it is of what we call the, one of the AAAS, the American Association's list of process of basic skills. Uh, and uh, I'll show you a list later. There's a list of basic skills and then there's a list of integrated skills. And the basic skills are the prerequisites for the integrated skills, which tells you they probably put two or more together to come up with uh, what they do that we'll, you'll understand a little bit later on. So, although uh, the skills must be taught in a science context because it makes sense to teach observing. So what did you just observe? was a natural product, right, the nature, the product of nature. It was not something that was man-made, like buttons or, you know, other things that I've seen people use. So, in other words, teach them in a science, a real-world context, like using natural materials, and it has to be overtly taught. Students are not going to learn it by diffusion. We oftentimes make assumptions about students knowing or understanding or learning things, and it's false. Most of the time, it is not true at all if we actually test it. So, how many of you, besides my students, have ever had any instruction on making observations? How many science people do we have in here? Okay. So, fundamental in science, but yet you have had no direct instruction on it. Well, I hadn't either. And that was why I started looking at this as something that was a hole in our, in our curriculum, if you would. But this skill is critical for scientists. 
Uh, and as I said, we make students, we assume students can make these in-depth uh, observations in their investigations, but we don't really teach them how. There used to be an activity called the lighted candle where at the first day of school, science teachers would have students be required to make 100 observations on a candle. Now, I have done that to students, I am sorry to say. I have had it done to me in professional development, and it is boring. It is not interesting at all, and it does not entice students to learn, to want to learn about science, especially if we do it the first day of school. Um, black boxes, have you ever had a, a black box experience? That's uh, something that's been used a, a number of years. And it's simply a, a small cord, cardboard box, and they put some kind of dividers in it and put a marble or rock or something that moves around in it. And you're supposed to be able to, you know, to listen uh, primarily and then make some inferences about the design of what's inside that black box. Um, again, you know, there's no guidance. It just says do it. That's what we have students, you know, do with little or no instruction. So, um, we know that students are not a blank slate. You've heard that for many years. Um, and we adhere to what we call the constructivist learning theories. And the idea is, and if you, what I want you to do is, I don't want you to think about students now, I want you to think about yourself. That we construct knowledge for ourselves. That's what you're doing right now. You are constructing knowledge from yourself, from your hands-on experience, from what you're listening to me or talking to your, your colleagues with. Uh, each uh, learner individually and socially constructs meaning as he or she learns. We've had some conversations about how to improve instruction, and there are, are many people who, many effective teachers, who are using uh, the first week or two of school to build teams and to do, you know, some kind of build collegial relationships. It's amazing to me how many students do not know each other when they get into a classroom, but yet they're in the same school together, even at the elementary level, you know, which is a very small school setting. And so what we know for, t for students to learn, there is that social component. They have to feel comfortable uh, in the classroom of asking and, and answering questions with their fellow students, but also with the teacher. And so you have to build that kind of collegiality in there. Um, one of the things that we do with my courses uh, is to use the love languages, which we've used with you guys, uh, to try to get to know each other better, you know, what the love languages are. And there are a lot of team building exercises that are done. Uh, my da Magonia, my daughter-in-law, who's the art teacher, she has kids do things, actually the first, at least the first two weeks of school, nothing about art specifically. It's all about team building. They're, they're uh, you know, drawing images of themselves, they're um, taking a color and, you know, talking about what it means to them. I mean, she's got all kind of activities that they do because uh, what she has found just in her, she's a very new teacher, she's the only third year teacher, I has found that that's what's going to make her art classes successful. And she has a problem with art because, you know, art's not tested, it's just an elective. And so kids are stuck in art classes whether they want to or not. So she's really got to do a big sales job to be able to get to entice them to become interested in art. And, um, and as I said, what she has found is she does this thing, you know, there's all kind of buzzwords, social, emotional, uh, components, etc. But it's all about building relationships, not only with the teacher and the students, which is what we hope we've done in here with you guys. You know that you feel comfortable about talking about things with your colleagues and with us, and to, you know, to try to do problem solving, etc. Um, but what you're doing right now, as I said, is you're constructing your own meaning right now about what you're going to do in August with your students, right? Yes. Um, I just had a comment because. We have an advisory mm -hmm. um, time, mm -hmm. and I think it's a major failure because they're trying to do the social and emotional, get the kids to know each other because we have very, very different kids. We have uh, neighborhood kids who are like in the projects, and then we have the West Side Austinites, and they're all going to the same school, and so we started mixing the advisories, hoping that, you know, they'll talk to each other. No. If you walk into any advisory, the academy kids are sitting in this corner, and the other kids are sitting over here. But I think they failed because they didn't even do it with the teachers first. 
So we gave them lessons, we showed them, you know, things that they could do, but the teachers, most of them don't even know the other academy teachers. So, especially when I got there, it was ridiculous. I cried when I got there because it was so separate. It was, it was like I stepped back in time and it was really sad. So um, we have a new principal now who, and we're working to, but most of the magnet teachers didn't even know the academy teachers, yeah. even though they're all on the same campus. So they didn't know their names. They but didn't that's, know. Not, that's but, not isolated. I mean, uh -huh. it is probably more pronounced with that kind of school setup. Right. Uh, but it's not, I mean, it's true of those <coughs> yeah, in general understand. schools. You know, we do not, it's, yeah. and that, that is a leadership issue. That's a principal level. And in fact, I was talking with a new principal at the Lockhart High School yesterday, and that was part of our conversation about, you know, building relationships, the importance of teachers building relationships right. with kids, but also the importance of, of building a, a, the team building, you know, within your building. And the kids can feel that. The kids oh, know yes. when oh, the yeah. teachers are together and... Mm -hmm and they know when they're separate. And I think that's why it was so easy for the kids to be separate, because the teachers are separate. Why should I talk to him, you know, right. just because we're in the same class? Exactly, yeah. Well, I think, I, I was able to do this last year. I, we did a lot of building projects or uh, displays that I required the students to do. They had to choose one amb ambassador that was a team whenever we were making the product. That was one of the labels. And even in fifth grade, so you copied us. I'm like, okay, how many? It's a poster, or it's it's a mock a display. How do you give it away? So they're actually required to go to the other other groups and change, and then they came back. And one of the required questions that I would ask is, "So what did you do with this that you learned from that group?" So they had to integrate what other people were doing. Right. Yeah. So, um, the the idea of constructing our own knowledge is important for us to be metacognitive about ourselves. I think until we do that, we're not going to help students and build instruction that enables and even requires them to think about their own learning, thinking about their own thinking. I remember when I took um, cognitive psychology, um, and there were like some steps of learning that were in there. And as I sat back and thought about my own learning, I thought it's like it's like the scientific method. That's not, that's not true for a number of reasons, one of which it is not sequential. So our learning is not sequential. You know, we'll go through this phase or this phase or this phase, and then we cycle back up to a previous phase, depending on, you know, where we are in our thinking. Um, but the idea of, of students understanding their own learning is important, uh, but probably now it's important for teachers to do that before we can do anything with our students with it. Um, the... Um, so this, this links back with the constructivist learning theory. So if we look at constructivist learning theories, we know that there are two consequences, first of all, uh, twofold with it. Uh, we have to focus on the learner in thinking about learning, not on the subject and lesson to be taught. So thinking about their own learning, like you're doing now, and that no knowledge is independent of learning, attributed to experience or constructed by the learner. Uh, our communities of learners. So it's not an independent, it's a very integrated process and a very complex one. So if we stop and think about our own learning where we are at this moment, if I gave you quiet time to do that, I think you could see the complexity of it. Um, teaching content and science, excuse me, science content and science process is consistent with the constructivist learning theory. Uh, so if we're thinking about teaching the processes of science in the context of the content, so again, you had natural products for your first uh, observation this morning versus man-made ones. Uh, metacognition is thinking about our own thinking. It can include knowledge about when and how we use particular strategies for learning or problem solving. I don't think we do a very good job with that. I was kind of sad this semester, this past semester, that one of my seniors uh, was an ESS major, but a biology minor. She did not know, at this point, her last semester in school, did not know how to study science. And she was having trouble with her, her I think it was her ecology course, but um, I, I 
worked with her you know, a little bit on that, and I'm thinking, okay, so if college seniors who have a minor in a science still do not know how to study science, how much more do our K-12 students not know that? And we make assumptions because we know how to study science that it's kind of automatic, but you know in the reading and the content handout that we've given to you, if you look at that, you can see how much different it is in social studies or ELA and what the how different it is to reading science content, but also how different it is if we forward that to studying it and learning it. Uh, so when we're talking about metacognition, I think that should probably be a part of our, if you want to call it, our beginning of the year, school year, with students to get them to think about metacognition, about uh, their own thinking about their thinking and thinking about their learning. And then how do you regulate it? What kind of strategies do you use? So I think in terms of working with kids, sometimes it means it's helpful to, to model that. You know, how would I study for this? I remember uh, teaching high school an honors class and one of my, one of my young men came in at, at uh, I don't know if it was midterm or final, but he came in and he was so proud. He said, I reread every chapter, it must have been the final, because I think there were 20 of them. And I did not want to do anything, you know, devastating. But I'm thinking, honey, <laughs> that was a waste of time. But I said, oh, that is so good. I am so proud of you. Thank you for studying. But I realized at that point I had not done a good job if he thought studying was just rereading a chapter. And I hear that too often even at college level uh, majors. Uh, there's no reasonable way to teach the processes without simultaneously teaching the science concepts and principles. Uh, this way, the students are able to act, uh, interact with the natural world like you did just now with your leaves there. So here's that list I was telling you about. So this is the AAAS uh, science process skills. These are the basic ones. All we're going to do in this uh, lesson is going to be observing. So these are the, the basic ones. These are the integrated ones. So uh, if you define something operationally, that means a student defines how they understood that concept. They're doing that in their own words. That should occur, it should occur in the exploration if you're using a 5E. Uh, but at any point, <clears throat> students should always define their understanding of a concept, no matter if it's a direct instructional model or if it's in uh, a 5E model, for example. So what kind of observations do we have? Well, you know, we have quantitative ones where we use numbers, and we have qualitative ones where we use words or drawings or diagrams. In qualitative, we primarily are going to be using the five senses, sight, smell, touch, hearing, and taste. So in sight, if you're going to use sight, uh, talk to your partner and, and identify some of the things that you can tell, that you can observe with your eyes.
Uh, so those are some of the things you can determine with touch. With hearing, some of the things uh, would be loudness, pitch, familiarity, direction, distance, clarity, or purity, like when you're tuning in, you know, radio, etc. So all of those are things that we can observe with our sense of hearing. In taste, of course, there's a four uh, old one, sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and then there's a umami, which is a savory or meaty taste that they have since identified, which is really interesting if you want to go and do some research on that. That's an interesting uh, conversation. So we don't normally use these in, in science, in taste and science, uh, but it's still one of the five senses uh, that um, you know we're going to, to think about uh, when we're making observations. So there may be some instances in which you might use taste. Um, also, as I said, familiarity uh, would be one. So, uh, you, you are going to, ladies, could I get you to pan the baskets out there? So you're going to uh, uh, get your basket. We need to, where are, where are cooperative, cooperative learning tents? <laughs> All right, so uh, you know the four, the four um, jobs, so I'd like for you to choose one job uh, if there's a, uh, I guess if you two guys would come over here, or up here, you can, and then you two, you four would be together, and you four would be together. So you're going to choose the PI, the materials manager, the recorder, reporter, or the um, maintenance director. So who gets the materials? Okay, the materials okay, so will the materials manager for each of those three groups come up and Alexis will give you your number one. Oh, yeah, that's fine. I mean, thank you. <laughs> so, in, in, your, in your basket, you, you, there should be four objects in there, uh, four rulers and four exploration guides. observations on your object. Do we 
Yes. Each person has their own for this one. By yourself, no talking people. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. Actually, if I had coupons out on your desk right now and you were off task, you would lose that coupon. That's how I used to use coupons with my students.
now I'd like for you to move to number two. So you're going to uh, get, a, get with your partner and select one of your specimens. It doesn't matter which one. And you're going to make additional <coughs> observations together. Elbow yes. partner or face partner? Uh, Pardon? Elbow partner or face partner? I think uh, elbow partner would work better. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Excuse me. Well, now If you like, uh, once you write those answers down, you can take a quick break.
independent. Um,